I started to research publishers and agents and get online and figure out what, what all this was. And for about two years, I um, submitted to age, both agents and publishers that would allow me to submit without an agent. And um, it was about two years. And what I found was I was getting feedback from these people. Like they'd say, well, this is really, really good. We just don't know what to do with it. Or this just doesn't quite fit our line, but keep going. And um, and some people would even give me little tips, you know, like maybe start it here or I would have the hero come in, you know, a little earlier or things like that. And I got picked up by um, a tiny publisher in London. I was the third, I believe I was the third author contracted. I just had the most amazing conversation with Jenny Hale. Jenny Hale is a USA Today bestselling author. Her books have also been made into Hallmark Channel movies, and you are about to hear from her. She's going to talk about how she became a bestselling author. She actually started writing books just as a creative outlet while she was teaching, and now she has a ridiculous amount of published books, and she's also the founder of her own publishing company. Now, I will say, about halfway through this interview, I realized my microphone was not turned on. So if my audio does not sound amazing at the beginning of our conversation, that would be why. I am a big fan of books. It is on my list of things to do to write one, both a nonfiction book and fiction books one day. I got to figure out how I'm going to find the time to do that between everything else that I'm doing. But listen, it is something that I want to do. And it's just so cool talking to somebody like Jenny, who literally started from scratch. She tells you how it took two years for her to get her first book deal. And she literally was just that person who was like, I want to do this. Let me hit up the Googler and figure out how to do this. And it's just something that she did. And it's led her to where she is today. I think you're going to love this story. And she shares some great resources if you want to find out more. So make sure you check out the show notes for that. If you haven't, tap subscribe because I am interviewing some amazing people talking about amazing things that I think will help you in your professional life and your personal life as well. So, all right, enough of me yapping. Here's Jenny Hale. Ever wonder how some people seem to get all the media coverage, but you don't? Go behind the scenes with a TV reporter, national on-air host, and news contributor who has interviewed celebrities, took you inside the Versace mansion, and even stood on a chair to interview basketball legend Alonzo Mourning. Get ready, because Become a Media Maven is the podcast where Christina Nicholson is sharing secrets from her years in front of the camera, in the editing booth, and now behind the podcast mic. I mean, it just keeps getting, when you think it can't get any busier, it just gets busier. But I will say, I mean, with that said, as an author and then now an author and a publisher, I work more hours than I ever did doing the nine to five stuff. Um, But it doesn't feel like work, you know, because it's what I love to do. Um, But I was an elementary school teacher for 18 years. I taught in public school. I was a district level educator. Um, in my last 11 years, I did ESL. I taught little bitty kids how to speak English. Um, and I helped um, create the original program that was started there in our county. And I wrote the curriculum for our county, the early, early stuff. And um, and so in the midst of all of this, I needed a creative outlet because I'm creative. And, um, and I was just, I mean, the day-to-day was just, Ugh. And so I would come home and write. And I, it, it was only because I liked um, to read, you know, this sort of genre that I thought I can write one of these. So um, I wrote a book and it was horrible. It was the worst thing on the planet and it's never seen the light of day. But once I wrote it, I realized I could get to about 80,000 words. I just needed to figure out how to do it. So then when I went back to reading, I studied my favorite authors and I started to notice what they were doing. And then as an educator, I went and bought books on that. Like, oh, you know, I, I have an issue with character arcs. Let me go read about that and try to learn about it. And then I sat down again, um, all of this while teaching full time with two little bitty kids. And I wrote a second book 
that was, I call my first book because it was the first real solid uh, manuscript. And that one was the one that went to Hallmark. It was coming home for Christmas. Okay. There's a lot there. So one, you were doing all of this like nights, weekends, like Mm -hmm. just as a creative outlet. Okay. What blows my mind is the first book, you just start writing a book and you don't have a goal of like, I'm going to get this published. I'm going to make money. Like it was literally just a fun thing for you. Yes. I never had any expectations at all for any of it. Um, You know, I went to college to be a a teacher. That's what I was doing. Um, You know, I was sort of raised that way. No nonsense. Like you get married, you have the 2.5 kids and you get a job and it's what you do. And so none of this um, even, I didn't even know if I could publish it or what to do with it once I was done with it. Um, It was almost like, oh, there's another fun challenge. Let me see what to do with it now that I've written it. Um, And so I started submitting. You have your first book that you're like, this is garbage. It's never going to see the light of day. And then you go from that to the second book gets, tell me about how you got that published because I'm assuming it's published before it turns into a Hallmark movie. Yes. So that was another um, step in the ladder. So um, to keep myself busy, I'm not a big TV watcher. I don't, you know, sit or I don't sit still very well. And so, um, after I wrote that book, I thought, well, now what I do with it? I mean, I might as well try to submit it to somewhere and figure out how to publish it properly. And so um, I started to research publishers and agents and get online and figure out what what all this was. And for about two years, I um, submitted to both agents and publishers that would allow me to submit without an agent. And um, It was about two years. And what I found was I was getting feedback from these people. Like they'd say, well, this is really, really good. We just don't know what to do with it. Or this just doesn't quite fit our line, but keep going. And and some people would even give me little tips, you know, like maybe start it here or I would have the hero come in, you know, a little earlier or things like that. So I joined a writer's group in Richmond. And because I had two little kids, I never got to go to any of their stuff, but I did get a couple of contacts that I could talk to. And they said, if you're getting feedback um, from publishers and agents, that's a good sign because they don't have time for feedback. And I can vouch for that, by the way, because now that I'm doing the publishing, you don't have time to sit and help people, even though I wish I could help everybody. Um, but I do send out little things. Um, so anyway, I was getting these little um, little nuggets and I got picked up by um, a tiny publisher in London. I was the third, I believe I was the third author contracted. Um, and at the same time, Kensington Publishing, which was a big publishing um, here in the US, they had the full. Um, and, then, and then this little tiny publisher that was... Um, opened and founded by the former marketing controller at Harlequin. He went out on his own and and opened this tiny publisher. And everything about this new publisher, this everything online that I could find, which was very little, just lit my fire. And I think it's because later you see what I went into, but um, with Harper Thread Press, but I loved the startup. I loved everything about it. And so I ended up going with um, this tiny publisher that's now, if you know it, it's Book Tour, which is um, under Hachette. Now it was bought out by Hachette, which I think is the third largest publisher in the world. And, um, and so I started with them. I stayed with them. It was a digital publisher. And, um, and then, I mean, I never looked back. I mean, for about three years, I wrote full time and, um, and kept writing under um, Book Tour. And then um, after about the third year, I couldn't do both anymore. My career was getting, um, going, you know, too fast. I had too much going on. I had deadlines. I had, you know, interviews. I had people who wanted to talk to me and, you know, mail and all kinds of stuff was going on. And I thought there's no way I can keep doing both of them. So, um, I quit my teaching job and I went full time and I stayed with Book Tour all the way up until I finally finished my last contract and decided to go out and do Harpeth Road Press. 
um, which is another story all in itself. But that's how I did it. It took two years to get it a took publisher. Two years. And then how did you go from publishing a book to getting it turned into a movie on Hallmark? So Nina Weinman, who is a screenwriter um, who does work for um, producers and, you know, for pr production companies that, that um, submit to Hallmark and uh, she might write directly for Hallmark. I'm not sure, but um, she was scaring um, the bookshelves and the internet for a Christmas book for a production company. And um, because my publisher was so strong and so wonderful, I was high enough in the charts that she found me. Um, so it was my first book. She found me. She she gave me an, sent me an email. I think it might have been out for about a year at this point. And she said, um, you know, I'm interested. Who has the rights? And I had the rights. So um, I started working with a, a um, an entertainment lawyer um, in my area. And, and, and we, you know, contracted it with option agreement, all that good stuff. And then it took a while for it to actually show up on Hallmark. It was one of those where like they took it and then they said, well, I don't think they're going to do it this year. And then it came out the second year. So I want to say coming home for Christmas was out two years before it showed up on Hallmark. It might've even been longer than that. Might've been longer than that. And then you've had more on Hallmark. Yeah. So I have another one, um, Christmas Wishes and Mistletoe Kisses that had Jill Wagner in it. And then, um, and then I have two more movies. They're not affiliated with Hallmark at this point, but they are optioned by production companies. So um, we're just kind of waiting to see if anything happens with those. Very cool. Now I've heard James Patterson has said this before, because he's had some books turned into movies and he's like, I hate the movies because they totally ruin my book. Like, are you a part of that process at all? Because I know as a reader and then somebody who goes to watch the movie, like we're always like, oh, that was different. They changed this. Like how involved are you in the movie making process? Or are you just like as surprised as everybody else when you go and see the movie? I'm just a surprise when they, when they buy it from you, they buy your characters off you so they can do with it, whatever they want. And then um, and I just sit back and watch it, but I'm one of those oddballs that I, when I write a book, I, it's like a download, like this whole idea just downloads off my fingers onto my keys. And then I edit it. And the minute I'm done editing that book, I'll turn it in on Tuesday and start writing another book on a Wednesday. And I will not remember anything from that book. And I'm not territorial over what's in it. I don't care if if Hallmark believes that the changes they want to make to my book would better suit their television fans I'm all for it because for me it's more about the creative process and reaching people than it is about my specific words and my story that I've created and by I mean I think I'm on book 22 I mean by the time I've written so many books it's no longer about um being territorial. It's about reaching people. It's about reaching your fans and writing what they want. And then, you know, Hallmark has a different subset of viewers than my readers. So if they want to change it, then I'm like, oh, that's really cool. It's funny how they had to change that, you know, for their, for their viewers versus me. I know what works for my readers. So for me, I'm, I don't get territorial. Some people do a lot of, a lot of writers do. It's just a difference in how I view it versus how they view it. That's so interesting. Now tell me what a typical day is for you. Like, obviously it's crazy when you're a teacher and you're writing, but now you write, how long has it been since you've been writing full-time? Gosh, almost a decade. Okay. So 10 years. So a oh, full-time would might be like seven years. Okay. Okay, cool. I left TV news seven years ago. So okay. I've like, been a full-time entrepreneur for seven years. So what is a typical day like? Cause I know you're busy. I know you're always writing. I'm following you on Twitter. I love your updates. I love seeing your perfect teeth and all of your pictures. <laughs> um, so if you're just listening to this and not watching this, you need to watch it to see Jenny's beautiful grill. Um, <laughs> but what is it like for you? Because you are like you, like I can see that you will end a book 
And then there's like no break for you. You're just on to the next, like, and not just what is a typical day, like, but where the hell do you get all of these ideas? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, early on, I would have a sort of moment of panic when I finished a book. Cause I think, oh, okay, can I do this again? Can I come up with this again? But now it's almost like a frequency you've just tuned into. So I'll just finish one and sift through my life and through my experiences and, you know, look around the coffee shop and whatever I'm doing at that time and something will come to me. And I've just sort of tuned that in to um, how do I tell a story that's totally different I mean, there is a sort of um, blueprint to it, you know, but with character arcs and how romance works, but you have to be able to make it fresh and brand new every time. And that's the excitement for me, not so much the actual story that I'm writing. It's the excitement of how do I reach readers with yet another totally different story and make it feel fresh and make it feel new. So um, that's how I come up with it. And then my, my general day I mean, I said I'm ADD and I'll admit it. I mean, the, I think the doctors even said you are ADD. Like I went, I went to the doctor once for like brain fog and she was like, you totally don't have brain fog. Like you're, you're for like rampant ADD. She was like, <laughs> but she said, that's a creative brain. That's how we work. You know, Makes so sense. I get up at about six or six 30 in the morning before I can even see, I put my reading glasses on, I get a cup of coffee I sit down at my desk and usually I have to get all the stuff out of the way um, before I can actually write. So I get all my emails done. I'll do a bunch of social media. I'll get all of that chattiness out. And then I sit down and I start to write and I can do about a thousand words a day before I tap out. Before I, I explain it, it's kind of like I'm watching a movie and I'm just typing what I see. And then after about a thousand words, everything just stops still and I can't um, think of anything else. And then I know I'm done for the day. Every now and again, I can eke out 2000 words. I wish I could do 2000 a day. It'd be so much faster, but um, <laughs> I'll do that. And then, and then once I'm done with that, I'll go on to something else with the publishing, like marketing takes forever and, and coming up with new ways to reach readers and dialing in, you know, all of the SEO and, and, um, and creating my company and building, you know, training documents and all the good things that come along with building a company. That's what I'll do the rest of the day. And then I might come back and try to write some more if I can. And in the midst of all of this, I'm homeschooling my high schooler. When COVID hit, I homeschooled both of them. And then I had one that was like, get me back to school. I can't deal with this. And then the other one loved it and his grades were better and he did awesome. So we just keep going. So I homeschool my high schooler um, during a chunk of the day as well. And then usually he'll go out and want to do something outside of the house. And I'll take my computer with me and sit at a coffee shop or something while he's off and running. I love and then that. I just keep working till like 11, 10, 30, something like that. What made you start Harpeth Road Press? Like, where did that come from? Because like you're busting out books left and right. Like you're on a good trajectory. You're getting them published. You're getting the movies made. So why are you like, let me give myself some more work and just start my own <laughs> publishing company? Right? I mean, that's basically what it is. It's just more work. <laughs> I, um, I think that looking back on my life, like I said, I was raised no nonsense. My world, I was not in a world full of creative people. Um, you know, I was in a small town outside Richmond, Virginia. There weren't people acting, painting, you know, there weren't people around me on a regular day that were creatives. And so I, I think I tried to, being a rule follower, I tried to mold myself into what the successful average person should look like. I got a job, I got married, I had the kids, I had the dogs. But I think that um, when I got into writing, I got into writing because writing was the most academic form of creativity. And I think in my brain, I thought that's acceptable. Like that's something that I might succeed at because that's the kind of person I am. I'm an educator. You know, I went and got a master's of education. I teach you know, languages, I, that's, that was sort of what 
I compartmentalized my creativity to be. But once I got into it um, and I started to get into the packaging and the marketing and all of the fun things that my publisher got to do that I did not get to do, the writing began to feel like the, the first step in a process that I never got to finish. Because for me, it was all about the visual and the branding and the marketing. And that's what got me jazzed. So the more I got into it, the more frustrated I got because I started to have these real ideas about how I wanted to brand myself. And the only way to do that as an author would be to go do it by yourself. And so, um, and I love my publishers. They were amazing. And I just, I just said, I'm don't kill me, but I'm going to go publish a book by myself and, you know, see where it goes. And, um, and so um, I published my first novel and I did everything myself and it was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. That was the memory keeper. And it also hit, it was the number one clean and wholesome romance on amazon.com. And so I thought, okay, I think I might know, how, know what I'm doing. I might know how to do this. Um, and, and I learned so much in those early days of book tour, because while they didn't tell me obviously what they were doing, I paid very close attention. And so, because it was interesting to me. And so then when I went to start this, all I needed to know was, do I know everything? You know, did, I know they couldn't, they didn't say, Hey Jenny, let's sit down and talk about what we're going to do. You know, <laughs> this is how we do your marketing because that's the the publisher's job but when they did facebook ads it stuck to me like glue when they did you know amazon ads it stuck to me like glue and so i started to piece these things together that my publisher had done for me and give it a whirl and when i did i was successful at it and so that's when i thought okay maybe my creativity isn't really entirely in writing it's probably more about marketing and branding as well so I started doing everything and I love it. It's just a lot of work, but I, I absolutely love it. And I feel like without the marketing piece, the writing is very difficult. It's gotten more and more difficult for me to do because I don't have that final say in branding, which is the part that I, my favorite thing is to take the story that's on, that's all in words and, and think, how can I represent this in visual form? in a way that evokes emotion and that makes people want to open the book and see what's inside it. And that's, that's the part that makes me so excited. So um, that's how I ended up with Harper Toy Press. I will admit I am one of those people who judge a book by its cover. I am shallow like that. And that is what I do. And your <laughs> book covers are beautiful. Oh, yay. They are beautiful. I was actually introduced to you by my friend, Christy Dosh. She um, has written a few manuscripts under the name Savannah Carlisle. So she introduced me to you. And then the first book I read of yours is it started with Christmas. And mm -hmm. I was honestly like, I don't know if I'm going to like this Jenny Hale girl because <laughs> nobody's getting murdered in her books. And I like murder and mystery and thrillers. And I have to tell you, this is one of the few, and I like romance, like I'm a Nicholas Sparks fan and I'll read, you know, all the romance books, but this is one of the few romance books where I could like sit, I think I read it in two days because it really is like, you think you need like suspense for it to be a page turner, but it really, it was a page turner and <laughs> nobody was killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one of my favorite things too, is, I mean, as I've grown in this business. If you ask me what's my favorite book, it's always my last book because that's the book that shows the most growth for me. And that's what I try to do is how do I hold that suspense without the, su the suspense, right? Like without, <laughs> you know, somebody getting murdered or whatever. How do you make people say like, I want to know what's going to happen. And so in my later books, I've started to throw in these sort of little mysteries and things that um, that come back around. And um, it started with Christmas did not have a mystery that I know of that I can remember. But as I've gone on, that's sort of, I play with that. I, I play around with how to make it a page turner. And so the mysteries are sort of, I throw those in now. So if somebody is writing a book, murder free, and they <laughs> want to send it to Harpeth Road Press, what do they send you 
and what do they need to include in what they send you for you to be like, yes, I want to publish this. I think, well, first they can go to our website, www.harpeth, H-A-R-P-E-T-H, road.com. Um, and then there's a, but there's a, you know, the top, there's uh, a link to uh, submit a manuscript, either with or without an agent. And then it tells them what, what to put in there. But I kind of describe it like this. If I go into Barnes and Noble or a bookstore and I peruse the book, my favorite bookshelf, I might look at five or six great books that someone is selling a lot of, but I might only choose one. There might only be one that I really feel connects to me. And that's the one I'll buy. It does not mean those other books should not be on the shelf. And lots of people are probably buying them, but I have to connect with it. And so with Harper Road Press, especially as new as it is, as small as it is, and with me sort of running it, I have, it has to be a book I'd pull off the shelf. It has to, or I can't put forth the massive amount of time and energy and money that it takes to publish it correctly. Um, and so, so first I can say that you might submit something that's amazing, but it's just not right for me because I can't, maybe I don't know if I can't look at it and go, I know exactly how to market this. I can't take it because it wouldn't be fair to me or the person who's submitting. But with that said, one thing that I look for in a submission is a slightly deeper romance. I want um, more going on than like the misunderstanding between the hero and the heroine. And again, that has no, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that for my publishing imprint, I'm looking for a specific type of book. And part of that is because when people pick up a Harper Thread book, I want them to know the kind of romance they're getting. Um, and then, you know, as we grow, we can branch out into the more, you know, the lighter romances. But right now I'm looking for um, a story where the conflict is both internal and external for both the hero and the heroine. I want there to be real issues that they're dealing with. And I want those issues to impact that love story. And I want them to come through it on the other side. So that's sort of the main thing that I'm looking for. Um, and I get a lot of really great stories that just don't have that deeper um, plot line in it, you know? And so sometimes with those stories, those are the ones that I will offer feedback. And I'll say, you know what? Like, you know, she might really, she might be going to this place to sell this, but I want to know what's her motivation for selling this? What's her motivation for it? Is, you know, is it the dying wish of her grandmother? You know, what's the, what's making her, what's propelling her through her life? And so that's sort of what I'm looking for um, in submissions. And I'm really, really, really um, careful and specific about what I'm looking for. Very good. Okay. I'm linking to harpethroad.com in the show notes, as well as it's jennyhale.com in the show notes for this episode. So listeners, you can go there and get that. I'm also going to link to your social media channels so people can follow you. Now I have a hypothetical question for you because this crazy thing happened to me this morning. I was invited to go to this warehouse. This guy was like, he reached out to me on LinkedIn. He's like, Hey, I know you're a book person. And we just rented this space and the guy who used to have this space just left thousands of books behind. I think he used to sell them on eBay or something. He dipped out. He left thousands of books behind. So he didn't tell me thousands. He just has a lot of books. So I said, well, I have a little free library. I can take a few and put them in there. And then I just donate the rest to the library. Jenny, I went into this place. It was like its own library. It had rows and rows of shelves with like multiple of the same books, like it was its own library. It was bigger than bookstores I've been to in Palm Beach County. So he's oh. like, I mean, I'll just give all this to you. I just need this space cleaned. You need to do something with it. So what would you do in that situation, Jenny? What would you do with all the books? I would build a shack out back and start putting them in my back, in my backyard. Now, I don't know. I think I would pick my favorites and then I would just have a party. Like I would have everybody I know who reads books 
come out there. And then we'd all get coffee or wine or something afterwards and read our books. Like go there to that location? If you felt it was safe. I, I mean, mean it's, awesome. it's a mess. It's a, it's like a warehouse just full of books. Oh my gosh. I know. So you know what I was thinking? I call and I don't know there. if this is going to be something with a lot of overhead because these books, they're not necessarily used, but they're not in great condition. It looks like, you know, some of them have been sitting there for a bit. Um, you know how at Halloween you get those pop-up Halloween stores for like a month and everybody just goes there and gets their Halloween costumes and then they're gone. It's like yeah. spirit Halloween or something with that big yeah. plastic sign. I was thinking, what if I found a spot and I just did like a month long bookstore, yes. but am I going to lose money with the overhead of renting the space and hiring people? Oh. And I don't even know like what kind of software do you use to get these books out and charge people? It sounds like a lot, but I am up. I am entrepreneurial. I am up for the challenge. It's just now it's like, what do I do? And then I was like, great. I'm talking to a best-selling author and publisher in a couple of hours. I'm going to ask her. Could you Can use the warehouse as the space? Could you use the warehouse as the space? It's not in a place where there's like a lot of foot traffic. Like okay. I would want to have it in a place where, you know, like a strip center where there's a lot of foot traffic. Yeah. There are some empty spaces in the mall. You know, I think as most malls have empty spaces now. Yeah. But again, I would prefer a place with a lot of foot traffic outside. I know. I'm thinking like those Halloween stores do a big tent. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you'd have to just hope it doesn't rain. But I mean, <laughs> you did a big tent. I wonder how much the mall would charge to let you use their parking lot like the spirit store does. Right. And then yeah. all you would need would be your iPhone, that thing that they put in the, the iPhone stripe or the, uh, is it stripe yeah. or square? Yes. One of those shapes. Now what <laughs> apps you use? I don't know because my retailers take care of all that. I don't have to sell directly to people. Right. I upload it and then, you know, Amazon, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, all of those, they um, sell it for me. Now, because you have a publishing company, do you just have like stacks that like, do you have your own warehouse just full of books? No, now my publishing company is digital, is a digital publisher. So all of our books are digital. So oh. I can give out whatever an ebook. That's I a have space a paperback. Saver. Yes, yes. And I have a paperback version of those books, but the way that it works is it's all uploaded digitally. And then Amazon takes care of the printing and the shipping of those books. So that way I don't have to, I don't have to worry about it. I just, I just do everything digitally and all of my ads are digital. Everything's digital. So um, that way, I mean, there are traditional publishing houses. I mean, there are traditional publishers as well. And I'm dying if there are any who want to partner with me. I'm so close to getting people in to, I want them to take our books and then go for it and, and give us a cut and publish them in stores. Um, but ours right now are, are online. So you can buy them at, um, it depends on the book. Some, a lot, all of them are on Amazon. And then we have some that are on Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Google play, you know, all the digital retailers of eBooks. Um, so yeah, I don't have to, um, sell them outright. And I don't have stacks of them anywhere. In fact, my family assumes that I do. So like, you know, my dad will be like, I need 50 books of blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I don't have that. I can help you order it, but I don't have it. Here's so, the link, um, dad. Here's my yeah. affiliate link. <laughs> Even better. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. How sweet of dad to order yeah. 50 books. <laughs> yeah. I keep going on, like I'll send you as many eBooks as you want. You know, I can send it in a, in a link and you can have the eBook you know, on your Kindles or whatever, but, uh, but I don't have stacks of them. My traditional publisher in New York will give me somewhere between eight and 10 copies of my book, my digital publisher. Um, it's all, you know, what you put in your contract or whatever, but they gave me three. And then, um, as a, as my own digital publisher, I can order however many copies I like, but I usually order somewhere between 10 and 15. So I can ship some out to bloggers and reviewers and then keep a few myself. 
Very cool. Tell me how you like that. Like I love bookstagram. Like after I read a book, I'm always like, this is the book I read. This is what I thought. Like the bookstagram community. I'm not into book talk as much, but I've heard book talk is amazing. I had Geneva Rose on the podcast a few months Mm -hmm. ago and she talked about this video she made on TikTok where she was like acting like the character. And everybody thought then that she was representing her husband in a murder that he committed where he murdered his mistress. Like people legit thought that. And that's how she sold so much of her book because people were like, oh my God, this is crazy. Listen to this woman's story. It's like, no, it's fiction. But I love, I love how like social media has become this like thing with books. And there's all these book clubs that like Oprah started it. And then like, you didn't hear anything. And now it's like amazing because it's everywhere. Yes. I mean, I love it. And again, the marketing piece is my favorite. My grandfather was a director of marketing and my grandmother was an artist, a painter. And, um, and she wrote songs and, and other things as well. But, um, so I think the two genetics together, that's why I am the way I am, but I love the PR and the social media. And I take that on entirely on my own. So Everything you see on both my social media and Harpeth Road social media is created, t- photos taken, everything designed by me. I do it all except for the book covers themselves. And even for the book covers themselves, my fabulous um, designer just knows how much I love it. And I'll send her ideas and say, can you make this something amazing? And then she will go and you know, just make this incredible book cover. But usually in order to write the story for me, for my books, I have to have a sort of template for it and then she'll make it. And then from then on, um, I put it on social media and all the graphics and stuff I design myself for fun. So I love social media. I think it's, it's the way to reach readers. For sure. Besides ads. For sure. For sure. Well, and the ads, the ads are on social media too. And that's how you reach them. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I love your book cover. So tell, tell your, your lady over there that she's doing a good job. Kristen Ingbritson is her name. She did um, one of the Magnolia stories too. And Denise Hunter, she's done some, she works for uh, lots of different people, um, but she's incredible. Literally. Very cool. Love it. So I'm going to link to everything we talked about so people can find out more about you and Harpeth Road Press. Is there anything else you want to add that I should have asked? Oh no, you've been amazing. I mean, just thank you. Yeah. Thanks again for listening again. As always, I am putting everything in the show notes for you. So you can check that out. It's jennyhale.com, harpethroad.com, and then all of her socials. You got to follow her on social. I actually connected with her on Twitter. That's how we became Twitter friends. And I was like, Jenny, please come on my podcast. Like, I see what you're doing. I see what you're tweeting all the time. I want to know more. And if I want to know more, I know there's a whole lot more people out there who want to know more. So check her out on social. And thank you so much for listening to Become a Media Maven.